today we want to discuss the wisdom literature. The wisdom literature of the Bible, especially Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs, has some real similarities with the wisdom traditions of other countries. It's more universal in this sense than any of the other sections of the Bible. Proverbs, for example, are found all around the world. Here are a few Proverbs. Here's an African proverb. Confiding a secret to an unworthy person is like carrying grain in a bag with a hole. Isn't that an insightful proverb? Here's a Chinese proverb. Don't tear down the east wall to build the west. That one's good too. How about this Egyptian proverb? Because we focused on the snake, we missed the scorpion. I like that one. It's a good warning. Here's a French proverb. He that spends more than he is worth spins a rope for his own neck. That's pretty severe, but worth listening to anyway. A Persian proverb. A gentle hand may lead even an elephant by a hair. That's a creative way to encourage gentleness. Here's an Arab proverb. Live together like brothers and do business like strangers. It's interesting that when you laugh at a proverb like that, you laugh because you sense the wisdom in it. Here's an Argentine proverb. The one who loves you will make you weep. That's a sad one because it reminds you that those you love most are able to hurt you most. Here's a well-known American proverb. If you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. An Indian proverb. Call on God, but row away from the rocks. I think that's an encouragement not to be fatalistic in the way you live. The last proverb I'm going to read to you was helpful to me when I was a doctoral student. I had it taped onto my study carol at the library to keep me moving forward in my studies. It's a Turkish proverb. Drop by drop, a lake is formed. In other words, when the task seems overwhelming, just keep throwing in another drop. A lake will eventually show up. And that's, of course, you're living in Phoenix, Arizona, where the drops will simply evaporate. Today, I want to spend a few minutes talking about wisdom literature in the Bible, focusing upon three books, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs. The question before us is, what is true wisdom? What is the answer from each of these three books, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs? What does Proverbs, first of all, teach us is true wisdom? Authorship. The Proverbs are collected from Solomon and others. These are lines from the song. Solomon is mentioned quite a few places. Others, like Agur in chapter 30 and King Lemuel in chapter 31, and a group referred to as the wise in chapters 22 and 24, find their place also in this book. And then there's some that are just unattributed. There are sections where you just don't really know who wrote them. So they're a collection in the same way as the book of Psalms is a collection. Now the purpose is for wisdom on the road of life. The Proverbs overlap with other wisdom traditions, as our introduction here showed us. The authors of the various Proverbs borrowed freely from anything that they found that was wise in the world. In other words, it didn't have to come out of Israel for them to count it as a wise saying. If it came out of Egypt, and if it appeared helpful and wise, they would begin to use it, as long as it didn't contradict their belief in one God. The structure. Early parts develop themes, that is, Proverbs 1 to 9. Later, an assortment of short and prudent principles, that's Proverbs 10 to 29. The biggest part of the book are just short, pithy sayings that are helpful in certain situations. So what is true wisdom? The fear of the Lord is the start of wisdom, but fools despise discipline. That's drawn from the key verse, Proverbs 1.7. Now, to fear the Lord doesn't mean simply to be afraid of him, though considering the greatness of God, that's, that sort of fear certainly would be appropriate. Derek Kidner describes the fear of the Lord with the words worshiping submission. That's a great way of describing what is meant by the fear of the Lord. It is worshiping submission to the Lord. Here's your summary. Proverbs teaches that although there is practical wisdom available throughout all the cultures of the world, true and lasting wisdom starts with worshiping and reverent submission to the Lord. At this point, I'd like to challenge you with something. Proverbs 2, 1-5 is a passionate plea to pursue wisdom, to get it at all costs. I've had many conversations with Christians who don't pursue wisdom because they think God is going to tell them exactly what to do when they have to make a decision. Now, I do think that God sometimes guides us more specifically, but he also commands us to pursue wisdom. 
The problem with the idea that God is always just going to tell you exactly what to do is this. Why would God exhort you to seek for wisdom if he was just going to tell you? God's specific word would trump wisdom in every case. So we should pursue wisdom while still staying open to God sometimes being more specific in his guidance. Otherwise, why even read the wisdom literature in the Bible? Okay, let's take a quick look at Ecclesiastes. Let's look at the authorship. Ecclesiastes shows us the preacher or the teacher teaching in the wisdom strain. The first couple chapters of the book identify this preacher or teacher with, quote, a son of David or a descendant of David who was, quote, king in Jerusalem. Many people have considered this to be Solomon, and I think that is certainly possible. What's its message? Vanity, vapor, everything is meaningless, like hopelessly chasing the wind. If Proverbs is mostly positive wisdom, teaching us how to walk along the road of life, Ecclesiastes is mostly skeptical wisdom, telling us which parts of life are a waste of time. That is, everything apart from fearing the Lord is without significance. The word translated as meaningless or vanity or futile in our translations literally means something like vaporous, like mist that is there for a moment and then suddenly vanishes. Everything's temporary. So you're wasting your time if you're pursuing them as the goal of your life. It's like trying to chase after the wind. That's a metaphor used in the book of Ecclesiastes. What are some of these things that are empty on their own apart from the fear of the Lord? Now, you can look these up again yourself later if you'd like. I'm going to run through them really fast. Chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 10. Laughter, fun, partying apart from the fear of the Lord is empty. It's meaningless. Chapter 2, verse 3. Drugs, excessive alcohol consumption. Chapter 2, verses 4 to 6. Real estate. Chapter 2, verse 8. Money, also immorality. Chapter 2, verse 9. Greatness. Chapter 2, 12 through 15, wisdom by itself, apart from fearing the Lord, is also meaningless. 4, 8, work, that is, on its own, apart from fearing God, has no ultimate purpose. 5, 10, money. 6, 3 to 4, focusing your entire life around your children but failing to reverence God is also meaningless. 6, 6, long life. 6, 11, many words. That one's interesting. Talking too much is empty. 6, 15 to 17. Both righteousness and wickedness. In other words, just doing good deeds for the sake of doing good deeds has no ultimate purpose. And in 9-11, personal abilities in and of themselves without fear of the Lord is empty and meaningless. Chasing after the wind. Understanding that Ecclesiastes' is skeptical wisdom is very helpful for interpreting it correctly. You have to read individual verses in light of the big picture of the book. Let me give you an example. Look at Ecclesiastes 10.19. It says, A feast is made for laughter, and wine makes life merry, and money is the answer to everything. You're asking, the Bible says that? Yes, the Bible says that. So is this telling you that you should eat all you want, drink all you want, and depend on money? No. The big point is that these two are empty pursuits apart from fear of God and obedience to his commandments. So you've got to keep the big message of the book in mind when you're reading through it. So what is true wisdom in Ecclesiastes? From our song, if this is true, fear God and obey for everything will pass away. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 to 14. The conclusion when all has been heard is, Fear God and keep his commandments, because this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. What's interesting is that other places in the Bible sometimes also bring in the same perspective. 1 Corinthians 6.13 could be taken straight out of Ecclesiastes. It says, Food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food, but God will do away with both of them. That sounds just like Ecclesiastes. You know, the whole book of Ecclesiastes tells us that a lot of the things that we pursue are fleeting, they're temporary, they're vaporous, ultimately meaningless. True wisdom is only found in fearing God and keeping his commandments. And this means, like I said before, living with a reverent and worshipful submission to God. Maybe we'll start pursuing the things that are really important once we realize how empty a lot of our activities really are. Okay, let's talk for a few moments about Song of Songs. What does this book teach about true wisdom? 
You know, some subjects are difficult to talk about, and the Song of Songs is like that. I spent a whole summer between my second year of college and my third year of college on the West Bank among Palestinians. It was a great summer, and I learned a lot. But I remember sitting in a room one day, drinking tea with a man who was probably about the age of my father. We talked for a long time about a lot of different subjects, but while we were talking, a 17-year-old girl walked in and sat on the stool in the corner of the room. We were talking for more than an hour while she was sitting there. She didn't say anything, of course, because that would have been improper in that family. And right toward the end of the discussion, the dad looked over at the girl and said, This is my daughter. Do you like her? Uh, what would you say? Then he said, Would you like to marry her and take her to America? Uh, as you can imagine, it was extremely uncomfortable. I'm sure I wasn't the only one who was feeling uncomfortable in the room. I mean, just imagine how she felt. Well, talking about the Song of Songs is a bit like that. The book is, for lack of a better word, steamy. So I'll use discretion as I talk about it. For example, I won't assign you parts to read aloud or have you discuss it in groups. All right, let's talk about this book for a few minutes. There are various titles of the book. Song of Songs is the one that we're using in our discussion today. It's also called Canticles, which is an old English word for a song or the Song of Solomon. How about approaches to interpretation? It's understood in different ways. That's a line from our song. The key thing to understand about this book is just how to interpret it. One main way that it's been interpreted historically, though there are some real problems with it, is the allegorical approach. Allegorical interpretation is when you take something that refers to one thing in its context and make it refer to something else. Jews have often taken the love imagery and made it about God loving his people Israel. Christians have often taken the same imagery and made it about God's love for Christians. Look at this example from Song of Songs 1, verses 2 to 4. May he kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Your oils have a pleasing fragrance. Your name is like purified oil. Therefore the maidens love you. Draw me after you and let us run together. The king has brought me into his chambers. We will rejoice in you and be glad. We will extol your love more than wine. The Jewish Targums interpret this as a reference to the exodus from Egypt. So God takes Israel away from Egypt and into God's own chambers. That is the promised land. Christians have often read this allegorically as well. For them, it's a picture of God's love for the church. So why have people so often accepted an allegorical approach of this book? Well, plainly put, because the book is simply too steamy for some people to believe that God would include it as a book in his word. And if you have a faulty understanding of sexual love, as many people in history have, then it's difficult for them to imagine that God could have put something like that into his word. But if you remember that God is the one who created the idea of intimacy between husband and wife, you won't go looking for other ways of reading this book. You see, the problem with the allegorical approach is rather simple. The book itself never suggests such an interpretation. And if the book itself doesn't give you any hints that you should interpret it this way, then to bring in an outside interpretation and impose it on the text is wrong. Now, once you've rejected the allegorical approach to the song, what you're left with is some sort of understanding that it has to do with human love. There are two non-allegorical approaches that are pretty common today. The first of these is the dramatic approach. That's what the line in the song says, or simply as a drama. Have you ever read through the Song of Songs and noticed that in the margins of some translations are words like beloved, or lover, or friends? If your Bible does that, the publishers are telling you to read it according to the dramatic approach, like a play where different characters read different parts. But you need to know that there are actually no words like that in the Bible, that is, in the Hebrew text. They're just placed there by the editors of your Bibles to help you read the text as a drama, which may or may not be correct. The second non-allegorical approach is that it's a collection of love songs. Like the books of Psalms and Proverbs, this book, in this understanding, would simply be a collection. Whereas Psalms is a collection of worship poetry and Proverbs is a collection of practical wisdom, the song is a collection of love songs. These would probably have been used around the time maybe of a girl's wedding, sung and chanted by the women who helped prepare her, or in some other way in a marriage context. The advantage of this approach is that there have been lots of songs like this found in the literature of the ancient Near East. 
and fewer dramas. Now, I'm still not certain which one is correct, though I'm, I'm not really open to interpreting it allegorically. I would go either with the dramatic approach or the group of love songs approach. All right, summary. So what is true wisdom? First, true wisdom includes practical lessons learned by simply observing the world. The book of Proverbs would move us in that direction. Second, most of what people pursue as wise is actually empty and futile. Ecclesiastes would take us in that direction. Third, it is wise and good to share intimacy with one's wife or husband. This is the message of Song of Songs. But fourth, the beginning or foundation of all true wisdom is submissive and reverent worship. Everything begins with this, so Proverbs 1.7, and everything concludes with this, like Ecclesiastes 12.13 says. Now, at the end of this talk, I'd like to draw a responsive prayer from verses scattered throughout 1 Corinthians chapter 1, since so much of that chapter focuses upon wisdom. Let's pray together. I'll pray first, and then you can pray aloud after me. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, to Jews a stumbling block, and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the strong, so that no one may boast before God. But by his doing, we are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. In the name of Jesus Christ, our wisdom. Amen.